I was thinking recently about one of my favorite cars that I ever drove was a Jeep. Now, don't, don't think it was one of those cool Jeeps. It was a Jeep Grand Cherokee. But I love that car. It was a diesel, okay? It's kind of this unique thing they did for a brief minute. You'll find out why it was a brief minute in just a minute. But it was a diesel, and I love the sound of it. You know, just had that, it felt manly just with the sound of it. You know, just, it had a masculinity to the sound of it. And I love that car until, boom, check engine light. And when I noticed that check engine light, I took it in, and they serviced it and gave it back to me. Boom, check engine light. So I'm like, things are bad. This is not good. Have you ever had one of those deals where it's like, raise your hand, check engine light, check engine light. I need to see my people because we're about to have counseling. And then suddenly it was kind of like this deal where they would have it for a week and I'm in a rental for a week. And, and then I was on the side of the road, broken down outside of North Park one Christmas season. I mean, it was just, it was turning into that crazy word, the lemon, and found out that as best as I can explain it, and I know some of you car people are gonna judge me because I got it totally wrong, but as it was explained to me, at some point, somebody failed to put a filter on an oil change, and some particles got into the piston, and it began to just shred the internal you know, workings of the piston, and, and basically just destroyed the car, had to get a new transmission, was never the same. And you could say it was one of those cars where it's just this progress of things going from bad to worse. From bad to worse. Have you had that happen in your life? Maybe you're in it right now where things are transitioning not from bad to better, but from bad to worse. Uh, you've worked hard on your grades, but for some reason in this particular class, you can't just get your arms around it, and so things are moving from bad to worse. You've been shepherding a child, leaning in, trying to provide some good leadership, and instead of things moving forward, you're like, what's going on? It's just moving from bad to worse. The addiction, I try to, I try to you know, white knuckle it, and I'm trying, and I'm trying, but why aren't I making progress? Things seem to be going from bad to worse. Our culture, as you look around, I thought coming out of the pandemic, boy, that was bad. But I'm discouraged, Brandon. I'm wondering, is the culture transitioning from bad to even worse? One of the things in the culture that caught my attention today that I wanna, I wanna highlight because it's just so broken. Did you see the Ivy League uh, presidents from Harvard, Penn, and MIT testifying before Congress this week due to the rise in anti-Semitism on the college campuses? They wanted to kind of get to the bottom of it. And so uh, under direct questioning, these three presidents of these prestigious organizations, these prestigious universities were asked a simple question and this pointed question and it was, it was this, whether calling for the genocide of the Jews, if you don't know what the word genocide means, it means total killing. We're talking Hitler language. Calling for the total destruction of the Jews. They asked, Congress asked these presidents of these universities, Ivy League, whether calling for the genocide of the Jews would violate their codes of conduct. Okay, that's a layup. That's a layup. Yes, <laughs> that's the answer. But that's not the answer that they gave. In different forms, this was the answer that these presidents, each one of them gave. It was basically that anti-Semitic speech would violate university policies when it crosses into conduct. Okay, calling for the eradication of people becomes a violation of the code of conduct when you actually begin to eradicate these people? Think about it. Racism, anti-Semitism, any kind of evil like that needs to be roundly and solidly, easily, easily, it's wrong, easily, it's evil. It should be a reflex. It should be a layup. This is not 
hard. And isn't it so weird how sometimes the smartest people in the room lack wisdom. Lack wisdom. What's happening is something that we said never again. We thought never again could this happen. How could they have done that to them back in World War II? How did people stand around and, and see this? And we have, we have this happening and you just look at a culture and that's just one of our problems. But you look at the culture, you say, how could, it have, how could we be moving from bad to worse? Peter, when he wrote the letter to the churches in Asia Minor, we're in 1 Peter, one of the letters in our New Testament. When Peter wrote to the churches in Asia Minor, they were moving from bad to worse. Now, they themselves were not moving, but there was a pressure against them that was increasing. They could feel it. So much so that Peter needed to write this letter to these churches to help them stand strong in the face of suffering, to help them to have courage when the world is crazy. Sound familiar? And this letter encourages us today. And I wanna remind you, if you've been a part of this series, you know this already, but for the many, many guests who are here every week, I wanna tell you the history of this letter is stunning. He wrote this letter in 61 or 62 AD. Now in 64 AD, so 62, 63 AD, 64 AD, Rome burned to the, uh, huge portions of Rome burned to the ground. It's, it's legendary that Nero, the emperor, he fiddled while Rome was burning. Whether that's true or not, it reveals what they thought about Nero. He was, he was evil. And right after Rome burned, a persecution, they, they blamed the Christians. Nero's needed somebody to take the fall, so they blamed the Christians. And a persecution broke out with such ferocity, such brutality, that Christians were, their lives were being ended just for having their faith. So I wanna highlight the point. Peter wrote this one year before the burning of Rome. Call it a year and a half, two years, before Christians would be fighting for their lives and their existence. And Peter wrote prophetically, instructing them, helping them, knowing that their life was about to go from bad, for sure, to worse. And we've been walking through this, these chapters after chapter, and today we're gonna go chapters four and five. So pray for me and pray for your lunch plans. I'm kidding, we'll do it. Chapter four, verse one. There's four, there's seven things that I've identified in these two chapters that Peter is just helping the church to stand strong when things are going wrong. So here we go, verse one. So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. For if you had suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you will be anxious to do the will of God. By the way, that's one of the signs that, that you love Jesus, is not your perfection, but it's your eager desire to be right with God, to chase God. You won't be chasing your own desires, but you'll be anxious to do the will of God. You have had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy, their immorality, their lust, their feasting and drunkenness, wild parties, and their terrible worship of idols. And of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things that they do, so they slander you. So here we see him speaking of the pressure. It's bad. Your decision to follow Christ is costing you. There's a teenager in this room that your desire to follow God's design for purity in your dating is costing you that relationship. They don't, wanna, they don't wanna go with you anymore because you're saying, I'm doing it God's way. They don't wanna do it God's way, and so you lose that relationship. Can all the parents in the house say, hey, let's encourage those teenagers that are making that decision. Can we do that? Let's encourage them, we got your back. It's tough. I had these old friends, you'd say. These friends, man, these are my boys. These are my boys. We laugh so hard. But I can't be with them and not drink. 
and I have an addiction. Christ has freed me from it. I can't do that. And they're slandering me. Sometimes we make calls in business. You make ethical decisions because of your faith in Christ and it costs you a bonus, it costs you a raise, it costs you a, a boys club. And we do these things and there's pressure. They were feeling pressure then and little did they know, although Peter could sense it, but this is more than sensing it. Peter was speaking prophetically. Here's how to handle it when you go from bad to worse. And the first thing we just read is if you wanna stand firm, you have to identify and reject the flesh. Okay, now that word is not used here, but it's used all over the Bible. And I wanna identify that word, the flesh, because it's a biblical term. So when you read your Bible, I want you to understand what it means when you come across, what does it mean, the flesh? Do not give in to the desires of your flesh. It says it over and over again in scripture. Here's what he's talking about. And Peter says it very, very clearly and, and wonderfully. He basically is saying, hey, we have these detour desires. He goes straight to the desires. Now, he also listed a bunch of behavior, wild parties, offering idols to these gods, all this, that, the other, the other, the other. And he did that, but he anchored it in you're chasing these desires. So God has a great potential for your life. This is one of the messages of our church. That God saw you before the foundations of the earth and when he saw you through the eyes of Adam and Eve, he saw you who you could be had sin not wrecked at all. Wow. He saw who you could be had sin not wrecked at all. Isn't that great? No insecurity, no depression, none of that stuff. No blind spots, he saw it. Here's the beauty. When Christ came, he gives us the same power that raised Christ from the grave to get you back on the interstate toward God's great potential for your life. But we take these detours. The off-ramp of desires. The off-ramp of grabbing a life that hasn't been given to us. The off-ramp of greed. The off-ramp of idolatry. The off-ramp of want. The off-ramp of lust. All of these off-ramps, and when you take that off-ramp, you are off-ramping away from your sweet spot from the great life that God died to give you. The power-packed life in the Spirit of God, these detoured desires. The Apostle Paul talked about it. Galatians chapter five, verse 19. Paul said this, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. And what he's saying there is, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's not if you make bad choices, you're not gonna inherit the kingdom of God. What it means is, if you are a Christ follower and you say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but your life is 100% described as a series of this choice and that choice and this choice and that choice, and there's no fruit in your life whatsoever, and you wholeheartedly give yourself to those detour desires, it's a pause for us to check if we really are saved. Can I encourage you on that? It's a pause for us to ask, have I really given my whole heart to Christ? Or is this just religion for me? Do I think I'm a Christian because granny told me I was one day? Do I think I'm a Christian because I attend this church? Or has there, has there been a change in my heart? Again, not perfection, but direction. Where's your direction? All right? So what we're talking about is this flesh. I have people in my life that help me with my blind sides. I have people in my life that help me whenever I have taken a detour. The number one person in my life, guess who? Somebody say it. Susan, you got it. I have others in my life as well. Susan is the loudest voice in my life to help me whenever I have taken a detour of desire. Because we all do. We all do. And I'm convinced, I'm convinced that we sometimes put whispers where sirens should be. We put a little whisper where sirens should be. Susan is the one that will tell me, hey, Brandon, you need a siren there, not a whisper. 
Do you have people like that in your life? That's what this church is here for. That's why we have small groups. That's why we, we gather like that. That's why when you serve, you want to get to know the people you're serving with because as you do community with one another, you'll begin to see, hey, you know what I've noticed in their life? They put a siren where I put a whisper. I think I need to put a whisper there. That's the power of community, and that'll help you with the flesh. You're not going to stand strong if you're just giving yourself to your flesh, all right? Second, so that's number one. Seven things to help you stand whenever life is upside down. Number two, stand firm, unlock the spirit. So we identified and rejected the flesh, now we're unlocking the spirit. Chapter four, verse seven through 11. God has given each of you a gift. Did you know that? God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Again, this is a whole series right here. I could do a series on spiritual gifts. Let me just quickly summarize. When you become a Christ follower, God gifts you in your soul. He plants something in your soul that is beyond natural talent. It's a spiritual gift. And we are to learn what that gift is, or they are, and we are to express those gifts to, what does he say, serve one another. Check this out. Do you have the gift of speaking? then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Amen. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ, all glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. All right, so I wanna help some of you that already know what your spiritual gifts are, and then I wanna encourage some of you to explore what your gifts are. And it starts with this. If you wanna explore, you just start by just talking to God about it. God, would you show me what my spiritual gifts are? And then you'll begin to get curious. You maybe read a book, you'll begin to Google, and we'll have a series, by the way. I'm already planning it in 2024, a series on the Holy Spirit. And part of that will be spiritual gifts. With that said, God, would you show me what my spiritual gifts are? Maybe you're a Christ follower and you kinda know what your spiritual gifts are. Can I just encourage you with something? All of us. When you use your gifts to serve others, what did he just say? You are glorifying God when you do that. So what does that mean? Sometimes when we think that we're helping others, all we think about are the people that we're helping and we feel good about that. But I wanna take it to another dimension. When you're operating in a spiritual gift to bless someone else, right now I am operating in a spiritual gift. Mine is, one of mine is speaking. Those that are in the parking team, Many of them are gifted spiritually to serve others, those that hosted us in this room. And there's a million other examples. In our kids' ministry, they're serving others. It's not just that you're helping the person right there. Guess what? You're in a communion with God when you exercise your spiritual gift. It says you glorify God. And this means this, whenever anyone is blessed by you, it is God blessing them through you. Did you hear that? It is God moving through you, which is the way he wants to do it, moving through you to them. And when you allow yourself to be used by God, I know it sounds simple, but this is big. Because sometimes we can get a little prideful about our giftings and we can think it's me blessing them. You are not blessing them. You are not the source of blessing. This is huge. You are the conduit of blessing. God's the one who told you to do that. God's the one who told you to be generous. God's the one who told you. And so God has chosen to bless them in this way through you by serving kids. God has cho chosen you to serve in this way with students on Wednesday nights. Whatever it is, you are not the source of the blessing God is. And when you operate with that attitude, you have a gift with God. It's like this cool thing that happens between you and the Lord. Isn't that great? And it'll get you through some hard stuff. First Peter 4. Guess what? Paul talked about it too. I love how Peter and Paul, they just kind of go together. It's, it's amazing. Verse 22 of Galatians 5. Remember, I stopped at verse 21 where you, the laundry list of desires and flesh. Verse 22, but, so we talked about the flesh. We've gone to war with the flesh, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified him there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. So when we're dealing with the flesh, we're going to war. When we're dealing with the Spirit, we're building a house. 
At the same time that you are going to war, God wants to build your life. And if you're only spending all of your time in the spiritual warfare of attacking the flesh, can I encourage you, you're missing your life. The power of the resurrected Jesus wants to build your life. Fruit, bursting and sweet. Things coming out of you that you couldn't produce on your own. A patience that's not natural for you. Boom, that fruit just expresses on the branches of your soul. Stand firm, unlock the spirit. Number three, stand firm. If you wanna stand firm, you have to anticipate that's a key word. Anticipate suffering. Anticipate. Chapter four, verse 12. Dear friends, don't be surprised. Let's turn to your neighbor and say, don't be surprised. Nine o'clock did way better. I'm just, you want another shot? One more time. Don't be surprised. Okay. <laughs> Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. This is so helpful. God, God is so, he's such a good father. He's coaching us. He's coaching us. I mean, little stuff. Hey, don't be surprised. You know what he's saying? Anticipate. This does not mean live in a negative way. Negative is my kryptonite. I don't do negative, okay? That's not my natural bet. I swim in a sea of positivity, that's me. Now that doesn't mean I don't see the negative, but I, I don't believe God is negative. I believe God has a positive, positive flow, but God can see the negative. God will deal with the negative. He lives in reality, but he is forward. This is not negative, but it is that our eyes should be open and anticipate, and here it is, Theology 101, we live in a broken world. Don't forget it. Here's another teaching. You are in this world, but you are not of this world. You are a sojourner, the Bible says. You are a stranger, and we are passing through. This is our eternal home, but we're not there yet. So when you see things like what I mentioned a moment ago, our hands shouldn't throw up in the air and say, how, what, Jesus, come now. And yeah, it's great to cry out, Jesus, come now. But we need to have a little bit of solidity to us. Okay. You, you know what I'm saying? It's like panic or, wow, okay. It's just two different mindsets. Anticipate, anticipate. He's teaching them, don't be so swept away whenever broken things are happening to you. Instead, you ready for this? Buckle up. Be very glad. That's shocking. Be very glad. For these trials, how could I be glad? For these trials make you partners with Christ and his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to the world. Did you just hear that? You get the great privilege when you're suffering for Christ that you are in communion with Christ on the cross. You are in communion with Christ when he was beaten. There is no greater privilege for the Christ follower than for doing what God told us to do. We experience the pushback that Jesus felt. And there is a communion, there is an intimacy there, but not if you're pushing against them. Not if you're, push, not if you're pushing against them. Rather, that you say, God, this is broken, I don't like this, this is not good but may I suffer well. May I have patience. May I have the right attitude. May I not cuss people out. May I just, just stick with it. May I be positive. May I encourage the people around me. You see, that's fruit of the spirit. First Peter chapter five, he keeps on going. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. All power to him forever, amen. All right, what's going on here? You will suffer for a little while. You say, but my chronic pain has been years, Brandon. That's not a little while. You say, this broken relationship has been my whole marriage, Brandon. That's not a little while. But for the Christ follower, Here's a mindset of suffering, you ready? The mindset of suffering that for the Christ follower, 
no matter what you experience on this earth in view of your millennia in new heaven and new earth, in view of your eternal life, however long you're suffering, it will be viewed as a little while. Do you remember when we, adults, do you remember when you were a teenager and you went through an awkward phase or you went through a, 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 a season of intense insecurity? Maybe there was something going on that really made you feel insecure and, and it was real. It's hard. And you grew up, you grew out, you matured, and you look back and you say, that was a tough little while. But when you're in it, it feels like it's forever. It feels like it's forever. Can I encourage you? Just like as parents, we can look back on a season in our life and we can say, oh man, that was hard, but it was a little while. Just like our time on this earth, a thousand years into your eternity, you'll look back on your chronic pain and you'll say, that was tough, but it was a little while and he'll put you on a firm foundation. This is called Christian hope, and it is your superpower. Christian hope is your superpower. It has powered the persecuted church through two millennia of suffering Christian hope. It is powering Iraqi Christians right now through their suffering Christian hope. It has powered the house church in China through intense suffering and persecution, Christian hope that I put my eyes on my future, not just my present. Come on. Christian hope. Different mindset. Number four. Number four. How to stand firm in a struggling world. Be encouraged with rewards to come. Be encouraged with rewards that are to come. 1 Peter 4, 17, for the time has come for judgment. Sometimes when we hear the word judgment, we think only negative. But you can get a good judgment. And that's what he's saying. For the, Christ, for the church, you will have a good judgment. You'll have a good decision on your behalf. It's time has come for judgment. And it must begin with God's household. We're first. We get judged first. Do you know that? Before you start thinking about, oh, how the lost world's gonna get judged, you'll be judged first. We go first. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news? Okay, first a word about, about this. There are two types of things that we need to be setting our eyes forward if you're experiencing real pressure and suffering. There are two things that you put your eyes forward on, and one is your inheritance. Inheritance. He talks about inheritance in 1 Peter 1, Verse, starting in verse three, I'll praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is by his great mercy that we've been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure, undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. There's a lot here. You can read it later. Let the Holy Spirit soak on these things for your heart. But hear me, inheritance is your salvation. And your inheritance is not what you earned or deserve. You did no work to get your inheritance. God did all the work on the cross. This Christmas, the title of the message, I'm gonna go ahead and give it away. The title of today of this Christmas's message will be Good News, Great Joy. And the good news is this. This is my Christmas sermon, okay? The Christmas sermon, I'm gonna go ahead and give it to you, is that Jesus Christ was born and with us and he lived the life that we couldn't live and he died to death that we were destined to die. And when he was on the cross, you were on his mind. You were on his mind. And that's good news. But he didn't stay dead. He did what only God could do. He conquered death to give you life. It's good news and it's gonna bring you great joy. Now that you've heard the Christmas message, you're all free to serve three services <laughs> right there, okay? There's a little more than that, but still. Truth, that's your inheritance, not what you earned or deserved. You ready? There's another. It's called crowns, rewards, 1 Peter 5, 4. And when the great shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. Okay, I wanna help us, because I've, I've been in church my whole life, and I wanna help us. Now, I don't know that many of you suffer with this, but I do wanna help you. Sometimes we can act more spiritual than the Bible leads us to be. And now that sounds crazy, but I wanna explain it to you. You may say, well, I don't need rewards. 
I don't want to think about rewards. I just do it to obey God, and I'm just playing from a win because he saved me, and, and I don't need rewards. Well, he seems to think you do need rewards. God seems to think that it'll encourage you knowing that crowns are coming. And these crowns are different than your inheritance. Your inheritance is built on the work of Christ, the completed work of Christ on the cross, crucified and resurrected Christ as Lord. Rewards, on the other hand, are you ready for this? This is a whole series, it's great. Rewards are the result of your faith-filled life. And he says, when you walk in faith and you serve, when you walk in faith and you exercise in your gift, when you walk in faith and you make a hard call, when you walk in faith and you suffer for me, reward, 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 reward. And if you wanna stand strong when the world's upside down, if you wanna stand strong when suffering is coming, it's okay to look forward to the rewards. Are you okay with that? It's okay. You know why? You can never forget this. He's a good father. He wants to reward you and, and cherish you and just give you good gifts. He's a good dad. He's a good father. He's a good, it's like a good mom, wants to give good gifts. Our heart is imperfect. His is perfect. And what we know about this, some of you may be jammed a little bit because you're like, well, well what if that person has more rewards than I do? Guess what? That's gonna happen. That's gonna happen. There will be people who are lowly esteemed in this world and for eternity, they will have more crowns than maybe others will, okay? How do you deal with that? You say, that doesn't sound right. I'm gonna spend my whole eternity jealous of that person over there. <laughs> I got a word for you. It's so hard for us to imagine a world without sin, isn't it? Where you would celebrate their rewards and not even a whiff of envy. Isn't that beautiful? But God says, hey, you're okay to be motivated by rewards. It's okay. Put your eyes on that one. It's tough, and you're making hard calls. Hey, God's gonna reward you. He's, you know what I love to think about rewards and crowns? He sees you. He sees the sacrifice you're making. He sees you. Number five, stand firm. If you wanna stand firm, embrace leadership. We believe this. We talk about this in Keystone Unlocked, that God has instituted leadership. It is his chosen method to make all things new. We love leadership at Keystone. We teach leadership at Keystone. And we are convinced that leadership is under attack in our culture because our enemy, Satan, what was his mighty act against God? Rebellion. He attacked God's governance. He attacked God's leadership. And he tore it down. Here, Peter is including leadership in this conversation about handling suffering well. Verse one of chapter five. Now a word to you who are elders in the churches. I too am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ. And I too will share in his glory when he is revealed to the whole world. As a fellow elder, I appeal to you. Care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it. Willingly, not grudgingly. Not for what you will get out of it, but what you are eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. And when the great shepherd, your leader, when the great shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never ending glory and honor. There it is again, another crown. In the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders. All right, this is important. When you gather with a group of friends, for a Bible study, and I've seen this on social media, people saying, I don't need to go to church, I don't need organized religion, I gather with some of my friends, we read the Bible, we pray, that's real community. That is community, and you are the church, but you're not a church, okay? Now here's what I mean by that. We're all the church, the bride of Christ, but the local church, God has marks for what a local church is. Evangelism, baptism, giving, and other, others. And one of those marks is leadership. So if you're all in a circle, hanging out, high-fiving, drinking Coca-Cola, prayer requests, I celebrate that. That's a Bible study. It's a fellowship. It's incredible. It's needed. You should do it, but not at the expense of a local church. If not this one, another one. And one of the signs of a local church is spiritual leadership. If you don't have leadership, there is this 
American Western church spiritual anarchy that's happening right now. It is pushing against any authority in their life. You want a lot of brothers and sisters. You want no fathers. You want no mothers. You're comfortable with brothers and sisters because you're talking to each other, but you don't like fathers and you don't like mothers, often because you didn't have a good earthly father. You had a bad earthly mother. You don't like authority. You've seen it done wrong, and so you reject it. Can I tell you, God's model is not dependent on perfect human beings. God's model should be inhabited by imperfect people who will get it wrong. Your mom's not perfect, your dad's not perfect, your pastor's not perfect, you ready? I'm pointing right here. This guy right here, not perfect. But I want you to know God has leadership to fight against the enemy's first sin, rebellion, okay? So we gotta embrace it. And he's saying you need leadership to challenge you, to tell you things you don't wanna hear to remind you of the way that it should be, to bring the word of God, to open it. And our job is to do it as a giver, not a taker, to do it lovingly. So this is beautiful talk about the local church and leadership. All right, if you're with me, say I am. Oh, thank you. Verse six, or not verse six, number six. Stand firm, if you wanna stand firm, you gotta possess true humility, true humility. So he's just shooting off chapter four and five, all of these practical applications of standing firm, chapter five, verse five, all of you dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. All right, I wanna help you with humility. I wanna help you with humility. Sometimes we can say we're being humble, and we focus on our behaviors of humility, and we think about the things that we're doing that define us as humble, and you say, I'm doing this, and that makes me humble, and I'm doing that, and that makes me humble, and more importantly, well, I'm not gonna be like that person, because that's not humble, and I'm not gonna be like that person, because that's not humble, and I, I find it interesting that often our definition of humility is crafted by us focusing on our own behavior, a self-focus on self is the opposite of humility. I'm confused, Brandon. I'm about to help you. So how do I, I, I see people laughing and smiling and those are the church veterans right now, okay? I'm gonna help you with what true humility is. Philippians chapter two, the apostle Paul made it very clear how we can dress ourselves with humility and it is not focusing on your good behavior and then looking and frowning at everybody else's bad behavior. Okay, Philippians 2, 5, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and was, took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth. Humility does not mean that you're always losing. How do I, how do I dress myself in humility? Stop looking at yourself and keep your eye on Jesus. That's how you get humble. You don't just focus on you and you're certainly not focusing on everybody else. You just keep your eyes on Jesus and the more you marinate on the character of Christ, his character will come through in you. The more you marinate on the sacrifice of Jesus, the more sacrifice will come out of you and it will be said of you, that person sure is humble. Well, you're not chasing humility, you're chasing Jesus. Humility is the fruit on the tree of the person that is clothing themselves with watching and learning and growing in Christ every single day. I know I'm fine tuning here, but that is important. And then finally, number seven, stand firm, be the church. First Peter 4, 7, he said, the end of the world is coming soon, therefore be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. And most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. Cheerfully share your home with those in need, a meal or a place to stay. And in chapter five, verse 14, he says again, doubling down on this, we are the church message, greet each other with the kiss of love. Peace will be, peace be with all of you who are in Christ. 
and they would greet each other with a kiss. Y'all are like, we're not gonna do that, right? No, we're not gonna do that. This was a culture thing in that day where they would greet family members that way. Okay, this is not us all of a sudden becoming like socialized. You know, we're not, okay. But it was a countercultural thing that, that they would treat each other with the intimacy of brothers and sisters. It was, I don't have time to get into it, but it was countercultural. They were showing a familiarity that was reserved for few and they were showing it to many. What's the point? What he's saying is, if you wanna stand firm, you can't do it alone. Susan and I, um, we, uh, we moved recently onto family land. And uh, it's, it's country, we have goats, okay? We have goats. I am your pastor, the goat farmer, goat rancher. And uh, we have goats, we have bees, and we have coyotes. And one of the things we learned really quick, living on the land with those sweet little goats that our kids would name and the cousins would name, we learned that it's important that they stick together, okay? Um, when one of them spends a little longer on this one little patch of grass and the others are starting to make their way to the pen and this one stays a little longer on the patch of grass, <laughs> and then we're like, where's furry? Where's that one? because it got away from the pack, it was vulnerable to the prey. When they stick together, it's amazing. Even the most vulnerable of the goats is safe. The little babies, if they stay close, they're safe. But when they stray from the pack, they're vulnerable. We are like that. We are strong when we're together. What did we read a moment ago? Our enemy is coming at us. Our enemy is bringing suffering. Our enemy is firing fiery darts. Our enemy is, is doing it. But listen, God is saying, if we'll stick together, no one has to stand alone. We're in this together with irresistible community and with extravagant sacrifice and with, with community that is real and with a familiarity of spiritual family. We can change the world. And we can stand with the strength that defies the current of culture that can be so discouraging, the current of other people's bad decisions that can be so depressing. We can stand with the strength, but you don't stand alone. We must stand together. So church, be the church. Let's pray together. Father, you're good. We love you. And I pray that as we walk through this letter, as we wrap it up next week, Father, I pray that we would be encouraged in a crazy world that we would have supernatural, spirit-empowered, biblically founded courage. It may be something that's supernatural, that defies explanation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.